This is the lecture for European history for Wednesday, December 9th, 2020. And we have a massive in-person audience of two people. The rest of you had better be watching at home! Good. Now that that's out of the way. <sighs> okay. Where we left things. The, um, by the way, feel free to look through this stuff, and if any of the tours take it, if not, just leave it there. The king assembled l'état général, the estates general, because he needed money. The estates general, particularly the third estate, insisted that he hire Jacques Necker to be his finance minister. He reluctantly agreed. Jacques Necker made a series of policy recommendations that the king couldn't accept because he thought it would basically force him into a power-sharing agreement with the Estates General, particularly the Third Estate, and that it would cut his military funding and palace funding. Basically, he didn't think that he could remain king in any recognizable form if he was... Um, if he was to agree. So the only thing to do was to fire Jacques Necker and dismiss the Estates General, which he does. When the Third Estate arrives, they do not disperse. They instead swear the tennis court oath on a handball court and insist that we're not going anywhere. We're going to stay right here until uh, the king deals with us, and we will be because we already are, the government of France. They rename themselves the National Assembly, and they begin work on the great project, uh, the Declaration of the Rights of Man. This is one face of the revolution, the idealistic face. The other face is of the Paris mob coalescing on the basis of a rumor that the king has decided to uh, use force, and that he has ordered the army to arrest the National Assembly, and that the army is on its way to Paris to restore the king's law and order. This isn't true. The king's hunting. And when um, this rumor spreads, the Parisians build barricades in the streets. Paris is a rat warren of tiny streets, easy to defend against an army anyway, relatively. But they need weapons. They need ammunition. They need gunpowder. And they also need to vent their frustration. In the center of Paris is La Bastille, the prison armory, this old pre-gunpowder for fortress in the heart of Paris that's a symbol of royal authority. The Paris mob comes together, breaks into the prison, takes all the gunpowder, begins dismantling the prison, and frees the prisoners. That's all within the pale for a revolutionary mob or crowd. How you can tell they have descended into a human locust swarm, a communal organism, a de demoniacal communal organism known as a mob, is by what they do to the prisoners. They take the prisoners outside, they slice their heads off, they put their heads on pikes, and they dance around all night in the splattering gore from the open neck holes of the prisoners. Thank you. Sane people don't do that, but mobs do. So, what the other face of the revolution is, is of an uncontrolled mob that does violence. Now, does the National Assembly, which calls itself the legitimate government of France, what do they have to say about this? Do they criticize mob violence? Do they say that this violence is not acceptable? That this violence is not in keeping with the burgeoning rights of man? They say nothing! Nothing at all! Because, well, the mob is friendly to them. 
and because they're afraid. A mob has its own logic. It's not going to follow the rules of decorum, niceties, and good manners. And if the mob suddenly perceives the National Assembly as an enemy, that's it. The National Assembly fears of lose power. <sighs> However, silence is assent. If you're around something that you know is fundamentally unjust, and you say nothing, you just let it happen, you might try to whinge and argue, well, I didn't do anything. <laughs> no, you didn't. You let it happen. This, by the way, is one of the hardest things for a person of conscience to live up to. When you see something that obviously is wrong, It violates your conscience. It's against your sense of right and wrong. But you also are darn certain in your mind and heart that your vocal opposition won't stop it. Won't do anything to stop it. The temptation is to remain silent. Play it safe. The problem is, that's still a moral choice that you're accountable for. The courageous thing to do, which not all of us live up to all the time, is to speak the truth regardless of the consequences. If something is wrong and you are a witness to it, be a witness to it. Stand up to it. Try to at least include somewhere in the event a dissenting voice saying this is wrong. This shouldn't happen. It may be the last thing you ever do. The mob may turn on you right away. And then you don't have to worry about anything anymore because you're dead. But the alternative is to live for decades in guilt and shame, knowing that you were silent in the face of evil. Remember the old Edmund Burke quote, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. And evil, in all of its forms, with all of its practitioners, understands this very well. So one of the things that evil does is it tries to get us to be silent. Because if we are silent, we are complicit. Our silence is assent. What we allow without comment is on our heads. Now that's hardcore stuff if you really think about what I'm saying. The National Assembly does not rise to the occasion. They dodge the issue. And uh, therefore, what I'm about to go into is going to ring a little hollow because it's a wonderful thing to be brave and talk about the rights of man, the universal, natural, inalienable rights of every human being. And by the way, this is a clarification. On several homework assignments, people talked about the Declaration of the Rights of Male Citizens. No, that's not what it was. It was the Declaration of the Rights of Human Beings. This was an old use of the language where mankind represents humanity. I still use that old-style language. But there was a document that was included in your opposed views, which had the Declaration of the Rights of Woman, uh, and uh, she was obviously making cases about the treatment of women, but the Declaration of the Rights of Man was to apply to all people, not just males. These were idealists. This pattern of the Paris mob doing whatever it wants and getting away with it is going to go on for years, and ultimately the question that you should think about while you're hearing these lessons is, what really is the French Revolution? 
Is it the high-flying words of the National Assembly, or is it the ripping of the heads off of their victims and putting them on pikes of the Paris mob? What's the real truth of it? And obviously it's a little of both, but what at its heart is the revolution? Is it good? Is it evil? Is it neither or both? So, the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen comes from a, the same history of freedom that our Constitution does, which I had traced back to Hammurabi's Code a few lessons ago. And what that means is there are going to be similarities between the Declaration of Independence, the U.S. Constitution, and the Declaration of the Rights of Man. But the Declaration of the Rights of Man is fundamentally different. It deals with an old society with a large lower class and an intact upper class as well as middle class, and it's going to go farther, much farther than the American Revolution in terms of utopianism, in terms of trying to create a philosophically ideal world, whereas the U.S. Constitution, being a political revolution document, is much more about limiting the power of government. So, let me read a, uh, a, couple, a few excerpts from the uh, Declaration of the Rights of Man. I'll, I'll read the blurb also. As the title clearly indicates, this declaration was inspired by the American Declaration of Independence, written in 1776 by Thomas Jefferson. The French version was written in 1789 and was supposed to be a preamble to a constitution to be drawn up by the National Assembly, and it was presented to King Louis XVI to ratify. But the National Assembly became mired down in internal disputes and failed to, to draw up that constitution until 1791. The Declaration of the Rights of Man encapsulates all of the principles upon which the French Revolution was based and is an outline of the government that was to be created by, the, by a constitution. In addition to Jefferson, it draws heavily on the language of Rousseau, social contract language. If you're going to be part of society, you owe society certain things. Um, ultimately, Louis XVI refused to accept the declaration, and the revolution entered its next more violent phase. In response to Louis' refusal to sign the Declaration, angry crowds, led primarily by women, marched on Versailles and forced the king to return to Paris. Interestingly enough, uh, as a second version of this was written in 1791 by Olympe de Gouges, who entitled her version the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Woman. But there we go. Here's from the Declaration, and try to hear the kind of laws that would be based on these ideas. The representatives of the French people, organized as a national assembly, believing that the ignorance, neglect, or contempt of the rights of man are the sole cause of public calamities and the corruption of government, have determined to set forth in a solemn document the natural inalienable and sacred rights of man. So what they're saying is that all evil in the world is social evil caused by government or society refusing to acknowledge and respect and enshrine as sacred the right natural inalienable rights of man. So what we're going to do is we're, we, the National Assembly, we are going to write those rights down so that everyone knows. And this is going to be a universal basis for anything that comes there hereafter. In order that the, this declaration, being constantly before the members of the social body, shall remind them continually of their rights and duties, in order that the acts of the legislative power, as well as those of the executive power in government, may be compared at any moment with the ends of all political institutions, and they may thus be more respected. In other words, by stating the rights of everyone and spreading the knowledge of those rights far and wide, the French people, which have heretofore been passive in the face of royal autocracy, 
will understand when the government crosses the line and that the people themselves will act as a counterbalance against a government trying to take too much power into its own hands. By informing people of their rights, the National Assembly is hoping that the people will help defend their rights against a predatory government. Okay. You know, I put my thumb right... Okay. Um, GPDD may be more respected. In order that the grievances of citizens based hereafter upon simple and incontestable principles shall tend to the maintenance of the Constitution and redound to the happiness of all. Hence, the National Assembly recognizes and proclaims in the presence and under the auspices of the supreme being following rights of man and of citizen. Again, it uses deistic rather than the Christian language, supreme being rather than God. Article 1. Men are born and remain free and equal in rights. Social distinctions can only be founded upon the general good. So this notion that people are born to serve and people are born to rule is undercut by Article 1 of the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen. At no point should birthright be a dis distinction. People are born equal and they're born free. Number two, the aim of every political association is the preservation of the natural and imprescribable rights of man. These rights are liberty, property, security, and the resistance to oppression. The aim of every political association. So, as with the American Constitution and Declaration, the statement is made that government is there for one purpose primarily, and that is to protect the rights of people. A government that does this has legitimacy, the moral right to rule. A government that does not primarily protect the rights of man, but rather that predates upon those rights, is no longer legitimate and no longer needs to be obeyed. Now, what are these rights? Liberty. You know what liberty is? Being allowed to make the important choices in your life. That's liberty. Liberty is not having to refer to some committee of experts, to some group of people who think that they know better than you how you should live your own life. Liberty is the freedom to make the important choices yourself. Oh, and to experience the consequences of those choices. If you decide to be a uh, useless waste of space drug addict, then you get to starve. Because it's not my job to support your lifestyle as a useless waste of space drug addict. You should work for what you take, for what you eat, for where you live. You are supposed to be free, not taken care of. So liberty is not the same thing as security. We prefer Declaration of Rights says freedom. The freedom to make the choices in your life that matter. Property. Again, I had a talk with Tom Smith about this. I uh, have an ongoing conversation because he has brought up the anarcho-syndicalist idea that you can have liberty without property, which is something that neither I nor Jefferson nor the people who wrote the Declaration of the Rights of Man nor John Locke would agree with. Property is the essential for freedom. Because property allows us to say no to the powerful. If we are in a society where everything is held in common, there's going to be some kind of commune collective committee that's going to determine how the resources are going to be used. And therefore, you are prey to the members of that committee. Because if you don't do what they want, they can cut you off. Only by having your own property only by having it universally acknowledged that if I get put in a day's work, I get a fair day's pay that we have mutually agreed upon, and that that day's pay is mine, no one else's, only from that basis do we have real liberty. Because only from that basis can I say, I don't need you. I don't need you to approve. I don't need you to agree. I support myself. This, by the way, is the great difference between teens and adults. Back in the day, before we invented teenagerdom, 
you all would be adults right now. Full adults with all the freedoms and all the responsibilities that involves. You might or might not be married, might or might not have kids, but you would be adults in the world working. If you were still in school, it would be because you were very lucky or you were in a wealthy family that wanted to give you extra training. Most people your age would be out in the world of work, living life, just like I am as an adult. <sighs> With freedom comes the responsibility to take care of yourself. With property comes the ability to say no to the powerful. Security. We do have a right to be protected from evildoers. That's the job of the military and the police. The military is to protect us from external enemies. The police and the courts are to protect us from thieves, murderers, and other criminals within our midst. We have a right to a reasonable amount of security. A government that does not provide that security loses its legitimacy. <coughs> Therefore, I would argue that the civil, the municipal governments of uh, Portland, Oregon, and Seattle, Washington are no longer legitimate because they have refused to enforce the law and that they have, and they have allowed anarchist, brutal thugs to take over their city center and prey upon the property and safety of the people of those, of those municipalities. That's my belief. Do you have any thoughts on that before we go on? Do you think I'm wrong? Do you think, um, you can certainly, I know it's hard with two people. I, I get that. Okay. I know it's a little weird. I'm not just looking into your eyes every so often to mess with you. I'm doing it because you're the only students I've got in the room. Yeah. Would that mean that, like, um, because Costa Rica, I don't think, has an army. So it may not have an army, but I'm sure it has some kind of civil guard. It has a police force. Yeah. But would that mean they're Ill 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 illegitimate? Well, what it means is that Costa Rica believes that it's relatively safe enough to not have an army. They're surrounded by Panama in the, to the south, and I, I think Nicaragua to the north. Yeah. Um, I If I was near communist Nicaragua, I'd have an army, because I don't trust those guys. <laughs> but uh, Costa Rica, the, the thing about militaries in Central America is they usually don't attack one another's countries. They usually prey upon their own people. And I think the people of Costa Rica, who get a lot of American money and have a lot of Americans living there, uh, think that they're safe enough and what they can do with just a police force. They don't need a military because the military might take over and start bullying everyone. It's an interesting thought. I hadn't thought about Costa Rica. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. So the, the, the declaration goes on and it's available. You should look it up. Um, there are some differences though. I mean, they talk about, um, let's see. I had I, I read the first six to every other year, so I'm going to read the first six to you. We've done two so far. Third, the principle of all sovereignty rests essentially in this in the nation. No body nor individual may exercise any authority which does not proceed directly from the nation. So this is different from the American system. American system says the individual is sovereign. There are state, uh, town governments, county governments, state governments, and the federal government, and everything has division. The French are not saying this. The National Assembly is saying that we are the government of France, and that the government of France is the government, the only government body that counts. We establish everything else: local governments, county governments, state government, you know, provincial governments, or what they call uh, directory. Uh, no, it's not directories. Uh, little, gah. anyway, the French Revolution divides France up into smaller things than provinces, and it begins with a D, and I don't remember what it is. Um, departments, they're called departments. Uh -huh. um, all of that comes from the national government. So unlike us, they proceed from the assumption that the national government is the only important thing that all power in the name of the people is wielded by the national government. This is something our founders would never have chosen because it gives way too much power to the central government. But there's a difference. Um, principle four, liberty consists, here they're describing liberty, in being able to do everything which injures no one else. Hence, the exercise of the natural right of each man has no limits except those which assure to other members of the society 
uh, the enjo which, yeah, the enjoyment of the same rights. These limits can only be determined by law. So, in other words, I am assumed, under the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen, to be able to do whatever I want, so long as it doesn't hurt somebody else. And as to what will hurt somebody else, that's what the law is for. All laws should be there to protect the freedom of anyone in the society to do whatever they want, so long as they don't harm other individuals or the body politic. Okay? That's liberty according to them. Number five, law can only prohibit such actions as are hurtful to society. Nothing may be prevented which is not forbidden by law, and no one may be forced to do anything not provided for by law. So all laws are there to protect people's natural rights. Nobody can be forced to do anything that isn't rooted in laws based on protecting people's natural rights. And um, no one can be forced to do anything positive or to, to not do anything unless it's rooted in protecting natural rights and in law. Okay. Um, number six. Law is the expression of the general will. Every citizen has a right to participate, personally or through his representatives, in the formation, in its formation, in other words, in the creation of laws. It must be the same for all, whether it protects or punishes. All citizens, we being equal in the eyes of the law, are equally eligible to all dignities and to all public positions and occupations according to their abilities and without distinction, except those that their virtues and their talents provide. No one has a leadership role unless they earn it through their skill, their wisdom, their hard work. And everyone must be equal under the law. It is not a nation of equal laws. If you can have somebody who, because of her high position, can flout government security policy and have a server in her bathtub and uh, get away with it. A true nation of equal laws would have prosecuted Hillary Clinton for violating her oath to keep government secrets secure, which several people in her State Department did. They lost their freedom, they were imprisoned because they were loose with secrets. She, the leader of our foreign policy under Barack Obama for his first few years, um, she routed everything through non-government servers that she controlled, servers that were hackable, and that were protected by private, not government, encryption. But she's never served a day in jail, she's never been officially charged with a crime, and she has never been punished. Now, if a Republican did this, I would say the same thing. I'm using Hillary Clinton as an example because her case is just so egregious. And the reason she has never been charged is because she was the wife of the president, President Clinton. She was the senator from New York, she was the uh, Democrat candidate for president in 2016, and she is just too important to be bothered with little laws for little people. There's something wrong with that. Anytime you have a person who is not judged fairly, equally, under the law because of who they are, you have a violation of the spirit of our laws and a violation of the spirit of the laws of the French Revolution. I could go on, look at these things. Basically, they add up to three words. The principle of the French Revolution can be summarized in three virtues, three rights. Liberté, égalité, fraternité. Liberty, equality, brotherhood. Liberty, equality, brotherhood. The French Revolution, at its best, is about trying to bring as much liberty as freedom to make important choices into every Frenchman's life and every French woman's life as possible. The principle is to provide an environment where freedom is the norm, not the exception. Equality, egalité. We are all under the law. There no longer is going to be a special death penalty for noblemen where they get their heads chopped off quickly and cleanly, but everyone else who gets executed gets hanged or tortured or whatever. No, no, no. We are all subject to the same death penalty. So now everyone who gets killed by the government gets killed like a nobleman by having their head chopped off. See? It's a better world. Um, 
and fraternity, brotherhood. We are all in this together. This is a Rousseauian concept of the social contract. If we want to benefit from this new free society, we have to put in our loyalty, our hard work. We have to be partners with the government, making everything work. So, liberté, égalité, fraternity, and the Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen are passed. But again, the background to this is heads on pikes. This is the Janus-like other face of the revolution. Remember, the Roman god Janus is the two-faced god. One face is nice, the other face is not nice. It's like Harvey Dent, two-face in the, in the Batman things. Flip a coin. So, do you get the National Assembly or do you get the Paris mob? Um, okay. So, time goes on. The king, in his notebook for July 14th, writes literally this word, nothing. <laughs> in effect, he means nothing happens. Now, he's not talking about Paris. He's talking about the fact that his hunt didn't provide him with any game that day. The king is living in the land of Egypt, the land of denial, and he's hoping that all of this will work out if he just leaves it alone. It's an oldie, goodie, goodie. So, the problem is that the food crisis gets worse. And when the food crisis gets worse, uh, food riots begin again. A particularly nasty one involves the docks of Paris and the people called Le Poissard. Le Poissard are the fish ladies. These women work on the docks of Paris cleaning fish. These are not feminine, delicate flowers. These women have muscles. They are corded muscle, wrestler-looking types. They, they do not look clean. They do not smell good. They work for a living, slicing and cutting through fish, taking out bones. They've got scars and calluses, and they take no guff from anyone. And when the food riot occurs near them, they say, look, our children are starving. We need food. Hey! You know, Felice says, hey, in her nice womanly voice, you know who has food? The king and queen at Versailles. It's 19 miles away. Let's go. And so the fish ladies lead what is called the Women's March on Versailles. But it's a crowd that includes all sorts of people. But it is definitely led by the fish ladies. And they go with their fish gutting knives and their cleavers to get food <laughs> from Versailles. Now, as they travel towards Versailles, uh, they travel to a very different place. A lot of the servants have left. The only people who have stayed are the people loyalist, absolutely most loyal to the king and queen and their children. Okay, there are some guards, there are some servants, uh, but they are the people who, who love the royals the most. Uh, otherwise, the nobles have left. So it's a much smaller Versailles population of the fish ladies and the Women's March is going towards. And there is a rumor spread by uh, Marat, the publicist of the revolution, who we'll talk about, who says that as the sound of this crowd is detected in the palaces of Versailles, uh, Queen Marie Antoinette says to one of her you know, guards, what is that? And he looks and he gets the information. He says, the, the people, they're revolting. And she says, of course they are. Uh, that, that's, that's, that's another joke. She says, why are they revolting? And he says, well, they have no bread. They want bread. And she looks at him askance and says, but they don't have bread. Let them eat cake. That famous line that was never said is supposed to indicate how out of touch the queen is that she assumed that people who didn't have bread would have cake as an alternative. She never said it. This was by uh, a publicist who enjoyed basically ripping into the royals and anyone who was wealthy. And Again, we'll talk about him later. But the truth is, when they hear of this mob heading to Versailles, the king does not get on a horse with his family and ride and ride and ride to the coast and get a ship to England or to somewhere. He stays. 
it'll, it'll, it'll work out. It'll work out. Um, so the women arrive. The guards and soldiers, for the most part, they're out of there. They're gone before the crowd arrives. Again, the people who stay are the ones who are the most personally loyal to the king and queen and their children. The women break through the gates and they start tearing through the palaces. Where's the queen? I'm sick of this queen, this Austrian queen. You know what? I'm really hungry. I'm going to take her hand. Oh, you're going to take her hand. I'm going to take her left leg. Yeah, we're going to eat good today. Meat's on the menu. So, ugh, I mean, you know, fish ladies. So, <laughs> not an exaggeration. They ultimately break into the king's bedchamber, you know, where, they, where he used to have his little games. Um, and the queen is hiding behind the bed, and the king is sort of standing there. And for a moment, the awesome reputation and presence of royalty hold the crowd quiet. But anything could happen. And um, the king says, in effect, what can we do for you? And they say, well, we're going to take all your stuff because it's not fair that you have all this and we don't. And the king says, okay. And you and your family, you're going to come back with us to Paris. You're going to not live here anymore. You're going to live in the Tuileries Palace. You'll still have a palace. But you're going to live in Paris like the rest of us. And the king says, okay. And they don't rip the queen apart and eat her. The king and the queen are allowed to get a few personal effects, gather their children, and walk out the front door, where they see a carriage that will carry them to Paris. Surrounded by a mob, that has the food and a bunch of the other wealth of Versailles. And right around the carriage are a group of people holding pikes. And on the tips of those pikes are the heads of every one of the servants and guards who didn't run. All of them were killed, beheaded, and made up to look like clowns. Because it's not just enough to kill them, you got to humiliate them a little too. So um, they... The royals get into the carriage saying nothing, and they ride to Paris, surrounded by the heads of the people who loved them and cared for them the most. You can't make stuff like this up. It happened. So, adieu, ancien regime. Goodbye, old regime. Uh, Louis' lack of response to the revolution. This is something that again and again, leaders... We'll, we'll talk about. In the 1800s, after the Napoleonic Wars, they will talk about this, and they will say that Louis' failure as a king wasn't the other stuff. It was that he didn't kill these people before they got too far. He dithered. He whinged. He, if this, if that, if the other. He did nothing definitive. If he had stood up to them, he might have died. His family might have died. Spoiler alert, they're going to die anyway. But he might have stopped it. He might have discouraged it. But he never really took a strong stand against the people that were taking the power away from him. He was trying to play both sides. He was trying, when he lived in the Tuileries Palace, to act like a monarch who cared about the people. Some things the National Assembly that sent him, he would sign. Some things he wouldn't. When he was brought into Paris, he was forced to sign the Declaration of the Rights of Man. But all the while that he is trying to demonstrate to the revolutionaries that they can work with him, he's secretly trying to escape. Because at this point, and maybe it was the ride back to Paris that did it, surrounded by the heads on pikes. He realizes that if he doesn't get his family out of there, they're all dead. That sooner or later the revolution is going to come for them and execute them. So in the middle of the night, in 1791, the king, the queen, and their children sneak out of the palace with the help of one or two loyal people. And they get into a carriage and they quickly ride out of Paris. They're going southeastward from Paris towards territory on the German border controlled by the Habsburgs. 
towards the Austrian border. But France has no highways. All the roads of France are back roads. So all of the roads of France require that you go through the center of every little village. So they're moving through the night. And they get within a few miles of the or Austrian border. They're almost there. But as they pass through the little village of Vahren, local militia are standing outside in the middle of the night. One of them stops the carriage and asks for their ID and asks for them to, you know, say what they're doing on the road in the middle of the night because that's their job. And when the king opens up the window, so that he can talk to the guard, the guard reflexively goes to his knees because he recognizes the king's face from money. The problem is, when you're the king and your face is on all the money, everyone knows what your face looks like. And the guard knew. And some other guys saw the guard suddenly go to his knees. What the hell's going on here? Why are you on your, get up off your knees? What do you think this is? The, the king! It is the king! Get him! So the king and his family are under close arrest now, and they are brought back to Paris, basically in chains. Now, everyone knows that the king was trying to flee and get away. Any pretense that the king had to being willing to compromise with the revolution is revealed to be a fraud because um, <laughs> he's afraid of the revolution. It's like a bully who says to his victim, what, you scared of me? You shouldn't be scared of me. I'm your friend. Tell me I'm your friend. Right? Right? Uh, sure, I'm totally trusting you. You're not a scary person at all. Right? The king signs anything at this point in hopes of saving his life. Now, I'm gonna skip a little bit. In the rest of Europe, as this cavalcade of mob violence and declaration of the rights of man goes on, the royals who rule other European countries do not like what they see. And in the Holy Roman Empire, the Germans get together and they say, we're gonna put a stop to this. So they gather an army, an army that's going to invade France, capture Paris, and end the revolution. Now, they've got, uh, they've got two candidates. They've got a prince of Prussia. The Prussians are the best soldiers in Germany. They are the modern Sparta. They're the heart of what will become Germany in World War I and World War II. Hardcore military. And there's a young prince of Prussia who's aggressive, who's a good soldier, who they could have put in command. But no, they put an old guy named the Duke of Brunswick in command because he's senior to the prince. And the Duke of Brunswick is sort of a cautious, doddering fool who is more concerned with not losing a battle than he is with winning battles. The Duke of Brunswick, instead of launching a quick attack, a thrust towards Paris, launches this slow advance into, Ger into France from Germany, making sure that everything is careful and everything is covered. And he's so defensive that he gives the French time to react. Now, at first, the Duke of Brunswick's forces don't have to fight because the militias of the revolution are not real soldiers yet. They see a bunch of their guys get killed with volley fire and uh, lines of bayonet-wielding troops marching towards them, and they just run away. And this happens again and again and again and again, to the point where the Duke of Brunswick begins to expect that the French revolutionaries just won't fight and that this will be easy. So he continues his plotting advance. <laughs> he, sends, he sends a message to the French revolutionaries. And the message is simple. We're coming. When we come, we're going to get you. If you do anything to the king, you'll regret it. Now, I don't know if you had brothers or sisters or if you were, when you were little kids, you used to have, you know, fights with one another or with your friends, whatever. 
neighbors, brothers and sisters. I can tell you that when I was a kid, if I ever said to people that I was having a fight with, whatever you do, you know, don't, 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 don't hurt my bicycle. You know, you can come after me, but you know what they would do. They'd go right after the bicycle because it would bug me. And if somebody did the same thing to me, I'd do the same thing because, come on, it's psychology. You know, uh, it's, it's like a person who sits down in the chess game and starts talking about he can't, how he can't use knights. You know, I know all these pieces and how they move, but I've never really mastered the knights. Oh, really? Now, it could be a gambit. He could be an expert at using knights and you know, trying to trick you into overly using your knights aggressively. But on the other hand, he's sort of telegraphing a weakness. And um, if it is a real weakness, then you can exploit it. The Duke of Brunswick has just said, whatever you do, don't touch my bike. Whatever you do, don't hurt the king. <laughs> I don't know what he was thinking. Because he's still slowly, slowly, slowly moving towards Paris. So um, uh, they put Louis on trial as a traitor and as an enemy of the people. And it's a revolutionary court. Uh, if you're not finding your people guilty, you're not working hard enough. So he is guilty before the trial begins. There's a mock trial. He's sentenced to execution. He's brought in a carriage out. Uh, and he gets to experience Monsieur Guillotin's invention firsthand, the guillotine. Uh, he stands. He tries to make a speech. They, they roll the drums. They yell. They don't listen to him. And then they put him on. And, you know, he says, well, may God forgive you. Um, and his head is separated from his body. Well, now the Duke of Brunswick's really, really mad. So he accelerates his advance. At this point, a group called the Sans Culottes step in. The Sans Culottes are men without knee breeches. They wear trousers that go down to the ankles because only noblemen and fancy boys wear knee breeches anymore. The kind of pants you associate with George Washington with the knee-high socks and the pants that just go down below the knee. No, no, no. These are the sans culottes, the sand culottes. They don't wear knee breeches. They're not fancy boys. They're working men. They're carpenters, blacksmiths, and so forth. And like the fish ladies, they lead a Paris mob. But not outside of Paris. No, no. They say, hey! You know, the Duke of Brunswick's coming. And even though we got the king, <laughs> When he gets here, all the enemies of the people, the noblemen, the priests, they're going to be freed, and they're going to rule over us again. You know, I don't know how the war is going to go, but I know this. Here we are in Paris. Here they are in Paris. You know what's separating us from them? A few guards sympathetic to us. Let's do something about this. Let's make sure that even if we lose, there are no noble dogs who are going to take over and rule over us. This begins what's called the September Massacres. The September Massacres involve the sans culot leading the Paris mob into the prisons that are filled with every priest, monk, nun, and every noble man, woman, and child. And for three days and three nights, they kill them all. The storm drains literally clog and run with blood. The Paris prisons are full before the Paris massacres. After the September massacres, they are empty. The enemies of the revolution are executed en masse. Blood is the answer. Now, this all culminates in the Battle of Valmy, outside of Paris. The Duke of Brunswick is finally getting close a guy named Georges Danton, one of the leaders of the Jacobin Party, the party for executing the king. The Girondins are the party uh, against executing the king. Georges Danton says to the people of Paris, you know, they're on their way, but we can save the revolution. Boldness! Boldness! And more boldness! And the fatherland will be saved. He calls the men of Paris to join the militia and go fight for the revolution. Lodas, Lodas. Boldness, boldness, and la patrie will be saved. The fatherland will be saved. So Danton saves the revolution by raising a new army to go fight the Duke of Brunswick. And at Valmy, the Duke of Brunswick does what he expects. 
he fires volley fire into the into the into the militia and the militia don't run for the first time they hold and they volley fire again and they're marching up with bayonets we're gonna kill you we're gonna kill you and the duke of brunswick expects them to break instead the revolutionary army inspired by danton's words fights and they actually push the germans back a little bit now at this point the duke of brunswick could have doubled down launched a general attack destroyed the french forces marched on paris but it would have been a real battle instead the duke of brunswick says oh i guess they're gonna fight you know what i wasn't expecting that let's come back next year about face back to germany the next time an army is going to get close enough to stop all of this is going to be 1814 when the Russians and the Germans march towards Paris to defeat Napoleon. That's the next time. The Duke of Brunswick blows his opportunity. The king is dead. The prisons of Paris are, are filled with the corpses of the nobility, the priests. When I say every man, woman, and child, I mean that. I mean, little girls and little boys, just because their parents happen to be nobles, are sliced and diced upon most cruelly until they are dead. Nuns and monks, whose job it is, and priests to care for people, killed most viciously. The revolution is stronger than ever. And that is where we will continue things tomorrow. Any questions? Okay. Guys, thanks for being willing to participate as the only two of you, and hopefully you at home understand what's going on.